So in the reading corner today, and I'm very excited because we're going to be talking about one of my favourite subjects. If I tell you that I have just made a toffee apple loaf cake, that might give you some insight into what we might be talking about and who we might be talking to. We're talking to David Atherton, and we're going to be talking about his most recent children's book, which is my first baking book. Thank you very much, Nikki. I quite like the sound of that cake. As a pity we're doing this remotely, we could have had a slice of cake each. Baking is something that is very close to my heart, and I learnt to bake at the apron strings of my grandma. What about you? When did you first start to really enjoy baking? Yeah, I think I was baking before I even knew I was baking. My mum was one of those amazing mums. She had five kids and she had to entertain us all. She would make the daily life that she was having into our play as well. She made fresh bread for our whole family every single week. I never had shop-bought bread. So to me, bread dough was Play-Doh. Like we played with bread dough almost daily. All my brothers and sisters got into baking from my mum, but I think I was the one that took it on and really wanted to learn much more about why things worked, the science, the culture, even from quite a young age. We'll get into all of that, but let's just stick with the bread making for a moment. And, you know, when you have to really give it some, uh, what did you call that? My grandmother called it giving it some humpty. (laughs) Oh, no, we were, we were way more boring. We just called it kneading. But I do think <laughs> kneading is such a meditative thing for me. And making bread in general is very meditative and very calming and very soothing. Not so much cakes, because cakes go wrong too often for me. But bread is my, is my safe space. There are a lot of bread recipes in the book. And I was really interested that there are not many that are completely brown loaves. So They're nearly all mixed white with brown flour. What's the reason for that? Is it easier for children to make? Brown flour is very difficult because there's a certain thing in brown flour that interferes with the gluten. So you don't get as nice a fluffy light rise to the bread. And one of my issues is with kids, you want to make it so that the end bake is very delicious, but also a bit easy to make. As you get better, you can introduce higher proportions of brown flour. But with brown flour, the most important thing is about feeding our microbiome, all the good microbes in our gut. And you don't need to have 100% brown flour to do that. You just need a percentage. So yeah, it's it's for ease uh, while still maintaining that healthy side. I like bread made with spelt. I like a kind of rough texture. Is that quite easy to make or is that hard? I just recently did my latest sourdough is with spelt, actually. I love the flavor of spelt. I come from the view that all bread is reasonably easy. It's about practice. I think we've we've got to that point now where people will try something once. And if they're not an expert, they think, oh, I can't do this. Actually, bread should be experiential. It should be something you learn by doing it and getting better and better. So yeah, I think doing a spelt soda bread, which is actually very easy and very rough, that's delicious. And just while we're on breads, uh, you've got a recipe in there, which it's something that I used to make with my son a lot. Hedgehog bread, complete with the scissors and clipping to make them into hedgehogs. Love that. Yeah, I think I've really enjoyed playing with not just trying to think of new recipes, but playing with ones I had from the past. Like you don't have to reinvent the wheel all the time. And the same, I I don't know how many times we did that hedgehog bread, which is really delicious because those spikes go really crunchy and caramelized. Oh, we've dived straight into sections of the book, but I really wanted to start with something that you mention in your introduction. And that is that you dance and you play in the kitchen. I do that too. There's something very playful about all of this, isn't there? Yeah, the kitchen is the most brilliant room in the house for me. And like I say, I know it's obviously not for everyone, but for me, the kitchen and cooking and baking is such a safe, playful place. I'm always happy doing it. In fact, when I was a kid and I was really into food, a lot of people commented and saying, are you going to be a chef when you're older? And I actually didn't want to be. Even as a young child, I said no, because I knew that I enjoyed food. I didn't want to make it into my work. And I wanted to continue dancing around the kitchen. I probably wouldn't have done that if I was a chef. So baking allows you to do it in a way that being a chef doesn't. Because you'd let things burn if if you're a chef. Whereas you've got time, you know, the whole thing with baking is leaving it to 
prove and rise and do its thing or you put it in the oven and you can then dance around a bit with your wooden spoon <laughs> yeah and you're not making a hundred you're making one or two and I th- I uh, kitchen for me is a very communal place how about you is it is it alone time for you because I I like being in the kitchen with other people do you I am very often alone in the kitchen until it comes to time to eat things and then suddenly I find there's a lot more people <laughs> <laughs> Tell us a bit about this book and why, as as somebody who's, you know, such a good baker and obviously enjoys it so much, why you wrote other books for children before the one that is my first baking book? Yeah, I think they're a set, actually. I, I see them as a set. So I really believe in inspiring kids to find their own way in a kitchen. I work in healthcare as my job before Bake Off. And I work in public health and there's a lot to do with diet and nutrition. Trying to get behavior change in adults is very, very difficult. And so I think the easiest solution is trying to capture kids. It's not about trying to force an agenda saying, oh, this has to be healthy baking. It's about helping them to understand what food is and then they can make those choices. So I've done three books. First two are cooking and baking. So they've got Mm. meals in them. And I think we just wanted to have a full on celebration of baking. Um, So the third book just focuses on baking. Tell me a little bit more about that healthy aspect of it, because you don't look at it and think, oh, this this is a healthy eating baking book because we've got our sweet treats. So have you kind of fed the health aspect into it? Yeah, I believe it's really important to have sweet treats. and. Healthy food, to me, if I'm going to make something so healthy, I may as well tell you to eat an apple. Like to me, I don't want to, people to have a chocolate cake that doesn't taste indulgent and doesn't taste chocolatey. And it's made with just healthy ingredients. It's like, no, just have those healthy ingredients and have a chocolate cake. However, loads of recipes can be tweaked. I mean, in the past, we used root vegetables. Like we've obviously got the carrot cake, but things like butternut squash and pumpkin and sweet potato have actually always been used to add sweetness and moisture. You're not putting that substitute in and making a worse cake. It's actually really delicious with those. So every recipe in the book has a healthy slant. I know we do have a problem with obesity in the country, but I want to pull away from thinking that healthy food is all about dieting because for example, nuts and seeds are incredibly good for us, but obviously very calorific. I would say every recipe has a a healthy aspect, but it's, it doesn't taste healthy. (laughs) Early on in the book, you say how fascinated you are with the science of cooking. I really like to know why something works. And I guess this is why I like to write recipes. A lot of people, especially people that go on Bake Off are brilliant in the kitchen, but actually when they try to write their own recipes, they can't because they've never done it. But I was the child that wanted to change the recipes and do my own thing. And I love encouraging that in the book. So all the way through there's little boxes saying, you could try and saying, you know, switch in some of the spices for the ones that you like, or if it's got orange zest in it, why not try it with lime zest or lemon zest? So I'm all about encouraging people to try different things and learn about the food. Yeah, I am very intrigued about the science of why bread rises and how best to have a cake that will achieve its full potential in height and things. And it makes a big difference though, doesn't it? Even even in things like doubling up, sometimes you can't just double things up because it doesn't work. Yeah. And obviously with cakes, if you're doubling up, but then just putting it in a bigger tin, then it's going to really affect the the oven times. One thing that's different between doing kids recipe books and doing adult recipe books or general recipe books is that you try to make the recipes as robust as possible. And I care about that because the worst thing for kids is to have an overbearing parent that basically wants to do the whole recipe themselves and doesn't let them make you know, make the mistakes. So you've got to have recipes where you can throw in an extra spoon of flour, or you could have like sloshed half your milk onto the side and the recipe will still work. I mean, it's probably going to be best if it, if you follow the recipe perfectly, but all of these recipes are robust enough for people to make slight mistakes uh, and they'll Ooh. still work. The other thing that I really appreciated in here is that it has both that fun. We've talked about hedgehog bread and there's cake that's made into a butterfly shape. But I like the fact that it wasn't just condescending to children. I mean, you've got them making a Swiss roll. Swiss roll's not that easy to make. No, I think a lot of these things are to do with practice and trying things. And I think kids can do a lot more than we think. 
Uh, and if you don't try, you'll never get to learn these skills. So for example, my friend who was actually the illustrator of the first book I did, her son was cracking eggs at two and a half because I was teaching how to make cakes. And yeah, I've got friends who are 30 that still can't crack an egg properly. So you've got to learn somewhere. And I also want this book. Yes, it's a kid's cookbook. It's a my first cookbook, but it's all about some of the recipes kids will be able to even try on their own. Like I get loads of Instagram messages of parents saying that their son or daughter made a whole thing on their own. I mean, the kitchen looked like a chaos afterwards. They they sent me pictures of that. But there's also recipes where you will need some adult supervision and it's kind of a nice time to learn together. For example, a Swiss roll is actually quite tough. The number of times that mine have cracked down the edges, but you know, it doesn't really matter. It tastes good all the same. Yeah. You're really interested as well, aren't you, in, um, you know, collecting recipes from around the world or finding out about the techniques that are used. I think you use a Japanese technique in your chocolate chip cookies or buns that are in here. Tell us a little bit about some of the global inspirations. Yeah, my day job has been working in international development. So I trained as a nurse and then I did my master's in global public health. And I've worked as a health advisor across mainly African countries, but then following that all around the world. And everywhere I've been, I've been obsessed with the food culture uh, and wanting to know more. Yeah, you mentioned the Japanese method there. That's where you actually heat up the starches in flour. So you use boiling water with the flour. And it means that the starches in the flour can actually hold more water. So it makes the bread a lot softer. And you really find out we, we tend to follow certain food cultures and there's loads of Indian takeaways in the UK, but actually there's loads and loads of food cultures that we've not even started to look into. For example, on Bake Off at the moment, there's a woman from Malaysia and I'm loving her bringing breaks each week and then me researching about, oh, what was that? What pastry was she using? So there's just, yeah, there's a huge wealth of baking all around the world that we don't know enough about in the UK. Have you been struck by the similarities to, for instance, just bread making? Uh, so many cultures make bread, but presumably they came to that bread making independently. Yes. In fact, the perfect example, the Yundani method from Japan, I was talking to a baker in the UK and he said, oh, actually, we've done that. We've gelatinized starches in the UK for a long time as well. It's just people don't know about it anymore. There's a big discussion about cultural appropriation or misappropriation at the moment. The nice thing about food is food culture has developed because people have appropriated other foods. So for example, the biryani that everyone knows from India actually came from Persia, but the Indian biryani is a thing. It's no one's going to say that they can't have that because it came from Persia. And I love the way that food develops through fusing different cultures. And I guess it's one of the nice things about globalization now that it can be at such an extreme that people are always mixing and trying new things. And yeah, and also going back into your own culture and learning about traditional methods. So tell us a little bit about coming up with the recipes for this book. Were there recipes that you already knew and used, or did you have to create some specifically for this book? The recipe, the ideas is my favorite part of the book. My brain goes on fire and I'm just thinking of all these brilliant ideas. And often it's recipes that I have already, like a let's say a base scone recipe. And you're just then thinking about how to make it a bit different. We've had cookbooks and baking books. We've had everything done. You've always got to try and think of something new and exciting, fun twist to be able to do. But then I do like developing. So sometimes my editor will come back and say, oh, can we do something with this and it'll be an ingredient. So then I'm having to develop one from scratch. But yeah, the creative part is my favourite part. Tell us a little bit about programmes like Bake Off. What attracted you to take part in that? And do you think that has an educative role as well as an entertaining role? Oh, I applied completely on a whim. Some people I found out later are fans of Bake Off and they apply year after year. I applied once um, and it was just as a thing actually to put me out of my comfort zone. I, at the time, was starting to learn a bit more about myself and thinking, okay, I'm very good at doing the things that I'm good at and getting praise for, but I want to try doing something that might make me feel uncomfortable, which sounds very strange because I went on and won the competition. But actually, it's not about the baking side. It was the, the discomfort was going on TV. I didn't like the idea of giving someone else control over the edit of how I would come across on TV. And that was such an interesting process because people don't know me from watching Bake Off. They know the character Bake Off David that Love Productions edited and put out there. Uh, but I really enjoyed that as well. So it has been a really good process to like let go of things. 
I think Bake Off has really got people into the kitchen. It's a really positive thing. I was talking to the producer when Bake Off first came out, they thought it was going to be a flop. No one was talking about baking. <laughs> what, like the cakes? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Thought it was going to sink in the middle. But actually, it was way more successful than they thought. And it really did drive people back into the kitchen. Now, I wish, I do have a small wish that they would feature a few more recipes that aren't just about towering buttercream and loads and loads of meringue. Because obviously, there is a health side that would be nice if they could push that. But as a general thing, I think it has got people into the kitchen. And especially the signature and the technical Every week, people try and do it themselves. So I think it is definitely educative as well. And what's next for you? More books for children, more books for adults, more getting out there and meeting people. What what do you want to do next? I mean, I'm one of those people. I'm a very adventurous person and I kind of just want to do everything. I love any kind of opportunities that come my way. I definitely... I'm more comfortable writing for children now. The books that I've done are all illustrated and that's very deliberate because you can get to do a full step-by-step of the recipe. So the kids and the ingredients list, and that's so the kids can follow along even if they can't read and it gives them control. Uh, But also, you know, the final pictures of a bake, if you get this Mm. perfect photo that's been done by a food stylist, no one can do, no one can recreate that. And if a kid's pointing to that, like the parents straight away, their heart sinks thinking it's not going to look like that. Whereas with an illustration, it can. So yeah, I've, I've really enjoyed doing kids books and I've already finished writing the one for next year. So that is coming out um, in a year's time. As for other things, I've just spent the whole day in a school today. So I started off doing the assembly and then I've taken sessions in the school until just running home to do this. So I love getting out there and meeting real people. But yeah, I mean, my ideal would be able to do some kind of TV show on CBBC to do with food and children and bringing people together. That would be my absolute dream. I really hope that somebody's listening to this that might see that as an opportunity. While you just talk about food and bringing people together, I do quite a lot of work myself with teachers and parents and children. And it's one of the things that I nearly always say, if you want to bring parents in and to get them involved, get them to bring some food in with them, especially if we're in areas of great cultural diversity, because when we taste somebody else's food and we talk about their recipes, we really connect and get to know them. Yeah. And I think it's such a, you know, you wear certain things like we were mentioning today, you've got beautiful green nails that actually match my beautiful green jumper. Uh, We're very bright. Like visually you have things like what you wear, but I think I get so much of someone's personality when I taste their cakes and even just what they've chosen to put in the cakes. Like for me, I'm a peanut butter guy. I love peanut butter with everything. And I've always baking cookies and cakes and things with peanut butter. And I like to think that tells people that I'm grounded and earthy and, <laughs> and maybe a bit rich and creamy as well. I don't know. But I think you learn a lot by seeing what people bring to a table food-wise about their personality. Okay. Well, here's my final question then. What are you going to surmise about me from my toffee apple cake? <laughs> Well, let's go. I think, I mean, apples are incredibly British. So I think you're very well grounded into your culture. And then, yeah, I think toffee apples are fun. They're like one of the most fun parts of autumn, aren't they? And and bonfire night and things. So I think, yeah, very fun as well. Oh, thank you so much. And it has been fun talking to you, David. Thank you so much. And, you know, thank you for writing Such a great non-patronising, but clearly well thought out book about baking for children. Thank you.